Hello, Paul Donahue. Delighted to be with you again for another edition of uh, Dollars and Cents. I want to thank Chris Foster and the team here at PCTV for producing another program. Uh, we just enjoy bringing you stories of entrepreneur and free enterprise here in our Champaign County community. Uh, tonight, some t terrific interviews with a couple of very successful uh, entrepreneurs, business owners, one whose success was really traced to this community college. And we'll talk a little bit about wh what that foundation was that led her to success in her business, a family-owned business, and another entrepreneur with a surprising location here in Champaign County who has global aspirations, highly recognized with national recognition uh, for her business. A couple of great interviews and a health care component, all coming up next on the next edition of Dollars and Cents. Welcome back to Dollars and Cents. Paul Donahue joined by Susan Jepson. Susan, thanks for joining us here on Dollars and Cents. Great to be here. Susan is the CFO of Reynolds Towing. Reynolds Towing is a remarkable story, a successful uh, towing company here in uh, Champaign County. Uh, Family-owned business. Uh, Susan's brother started the firm. And uh, just tell us a little bit more about the, the history of Reynolds Towing, Susan. Um, Greg actually started Parkland College in... Oh, I think it was 1980 and was in a terrible car accident in October and had to withdraw that semester because of his illnesses related to the car accident. So he went to work for a gas station that had one tow truck and he wasn't really too interested in the gas station but enjoyed the tow truck business. So he has grown off that one truck to we have about 50 vehicles now and a very large towing company here in central Illinois um, do a number of things. How did you get involved with the company or when did you come on board? Well, I also had gone to Parkland and had done accounting and was with a not-for-profit association and really enjoyed my job 830 to 430 and you know kind of laid back and Greg asked me to come by and he was having some trouble with his accounting and his business was growing and he really needed some help with his software and his accounting and so I'd stop by and about the third night he said okay well, when can you start? Oh, that's <laughs> terrific. What's been the experience so far working with your brother and growing the business and seeing it from your perspective it's been fun it's um we my parents were concerned that we we're going to kill each other working together but that hasn't happened yet so it's we work well i enjoy the accounting and the bookkeeping and the inside aspect he loves the trucks and the the outside aspects so it's been a great mix it's been a family thing to do yeah how about the family-owned business in general when you look at the um, success of family-owned firms around the country. I mean, if you just you know, look at Ford and you look at all major corporations in this company, start, this country started as family-owned businesses. Do you have a special appreciation for, for family-owned firms in general? I do. It's, it's a lot of, you realize how much hard work goes into it yeah. because you start small and you grow big and you realize that you can do it and it's fun and it's great to get involved with the community and have employees and it, when it's your business you see all aspects of it so that is fun. Now the challenges uh, of family-owned firms as well, can you just speak to some of the, the the concerns or the issues that you have to deal with that you may not have with a, a larger corporation? Well, in towing, it's 24-7, yeah. so it's answering the phone on holidays and, and you know, snowstorms on Christmas, you don't have Christmas, you help everybody else get to their Christmas, so that, that part of it can be challenging, making sure that the people that you have to have there show up and if you've got to cover them if they don't, but fortunately we've had a great crew and it's not been too bad. You mentioned your brother Greg and yourself both have strong connections to, to Parkland. Talk about your experience here at Parkland and, and what that did for you to, to prepare I you have for business. Associate's degree in accounting from Parkland yes. and um, really enjoyed accounting in high school and followed through um, here at Parkland. Um, had a great experience, loved the college. Mm -hmm. um, Greg had fully intended to go into automotive here and had started before he had the accident and then his business just grew and he never got back to it. But we both have been supporters of, of local community and the Parkland College. Nice. What do you think accounted for his success, if you could pinpoint it, or what is it about your brother that makes him successful? I mean, have you thought about, wow, how did, how did we get here? He's very driven. He, yeah. he loves to be moving and to, to be going and getting involved. And, and it, um, I think one of the things that's helped our business is the community involvement. Like, we get so involved in um, parades and the 4th of July and, you know, 
Labor Day. We donate to so many different organizations that are putting on fundraisers, um, the Illinois Marathon, great involvement with the Illinois Marathon. So you can kind of cross over and towing doesn't always have a great name. I mean, people are never happy when they're towed. So to, to put that name behind a lot of community involvement's been good. Well, the marathon obviously is another example of a phenomenal success story, right. kind of an entrepreneurial initiative all, all its own. It is, and he's also involved in that, and I am as well. I do the accounting for the Illinois Marathon, and um, we enjoy it. It's fun. It's great to be involved in something that's so great for our community. When you say he's driven, what does that look like for people? Is there something that um, some of our employees will say, wow, I wish he wasn't so driven. <laughs> <laughs> he's like, where's your truck? <laughs> you know, he's always, yeah. everybody has to keep moving. Right. And that's how Greg, that's how he works. And that's how he's got to where he's been and, and or you, where he's at. And what do you think that says about what's required to be successful as an entrepreneur? I think it's very important. I think um, he is very um, involved in his business. He is there on a daily basis. He, he, he's grown it, but he's still there to, to help run it. He, he likes to sit right there with it. Like if a big truck rolls over, Greg's one of the first people that's out there on the scene. So nice. he, he has very capable guys that are working for us that can do it, but if he's there, he'll still go out and do it too. And what do you provide in your view, the strength for the company that you're providing that say, so yeah, that I see how I'm adding this value to help us be successful. Yeah, I do that in the he feels comfortable that I can handle anything in the office and he doesn't have to worry about that. He can go out and be on a rollover and not worry about what's happening with nice. his books or whatever. So you, yeah. You take care of that, that home office. I do. What's your thoughts on the country, the economy, where we're going, the environment for small business today, it's, locally, nationally, statewide. What are your thoughts on that? It's scary, and I, you know, you can definitely see how some things are affected and how some things aren't. Fortunately, towing is one of those things that people still need. I mean, we've definitely seen changes in our business with the economy. When I started with Greg in 1990 this today's move-in day for the U of I kids would come with Lexus they would come with SUVs they would come with mom and dad's credit card yeah. they they would park anywhere and everywhere and didn't care now they come with junkier cars and they're more careful about what they park <laughs> that's an interesting perspective on what has occurred it, transition it, it definitely. That, that, that's an interesting uh, outlier now when you say it's scary what other pieces of the economy scare you or make you nervous um, gas prices. Yeah. Gas prices definitely affect our business. Um, People drive less. People drive they, less. You know, less vacations with the intersecting yeah. highways. In the summer, used to be crazy because we have 74, 57, and 72, right. so there was constantly vacation travel, and we've noticed that's down. Interesting. Um, the future of your business, do you look ahead five, ten years, and do you see the business transforming in any way, or are you experimenting or looking in different markets for, for potential growth opportunities? You know, we've grown a lot in the, in the 13 years I've worked with Greg. Yeah. He's had the business since 1980, and he's always continued to grow. I don't think it will grow as fast as it has because of the economy and because um, our business is changing with motor clubs. Um, a lot of people are getting involved in the towing business that really affects our business. So, What about folks that are watching the program, thinking about going into business? What would you tell them? What are some thoughts that you can share with folks that are starting businesses, in businesses, contemplating I starting think a business? It all depends on the type of business you're going to go in, but you know, it, it's great to own your own business. It's great to be your own bosses. It's great to um, have have that family that you work with. Yeah. Um, so I think if it's, there's always a risk, but if, if you feel confident that you can do it, it's worth a try. And the Reynolds Towing Company has certainly uh, taken that risk and has managed that risk successfully to produce one of the most successful local family-owned businesses in the community. Congratulations yeah. on your success. Thank you. Thanks for spending time with us on Dollars and Cents. Alrighty, thanks for having me. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Dollars and Cents. Uh, delighted to introduce to you Betty Brennan. Uh, Betty is the CEO of a company, Taylor Studios. Uh, fascinating company. You know, you ever go to a museum and you walk in and they have the displays of, you know, wildlife display or a dinosaur display or whatever it is. 
Well, Betty's firm manufactures, you know, displays for museums, nonprofits uh, all over the country, and now you're thinking about doing it all over the world, Betty. Correct. Welcome to Dollars and Cents. Thank you. Thanks for having me. That was a very poor description of what <laughs> you do, but that's just kind of my concept. Could you elaborate a little bit on Taylor Studios and the work that you do? Sure. It's planning, design, and fabrication. So we can do a turnkey operation or we can come in at any point. So you're exactly right. You walk into a museum and you see an immersive environment. We're very good at the scenic work or transporting the visitor to another time and place, whether it's historical or whether it's a swamp um, and so we tell stories so the planning part is is creating the central theme the sub theme and the storylines and sort of having a path and thinking about visitor reaction um, and you know keeping those text panels brief because they don't like to read necessarily and so we know all of those aspects of of uh, display work highly recognized firm this is a firm that's been recognized as the fastest growing small company in multiple years by Inc 500 Inc 5000 you know talk about your success and talk about the growth that you've had over the years yeah well 20 years started in a garage and a renovated chicken coop and been doing this for 20 years so humble roots a garage in a renovated chicken coop and a loft of a horse barn <laughs> <laughs> luckily my landlord put up with me because <laughs> I moved horses in too <laughs> but uh, he was very helpful too in the beginning and even wow. built us our first production building so I've had a lot of support along the way. What's accounted for the success and did you anticipate the success 20 years ago? Did you think you'd be where you are now? Well, you know, I've always wanted to be an entrepreneur, so even at age 19, I told my business partner at the time, or who was going to be my business partner, I'm going to make Bank 500. So I had some audacious goals, but, uh, you know, whether I would achieve it or not, who knows, but uh, I was driven to, to try and make it happen. Where do you place these displays? How wide of a market area do you serve? Uh, well, national for sure, and we've done a little bit of international work, and of course I'm heading to China to try to win more work. Um, but, you know, Smithsonian, D-Day Museum, the Gettysburg Cyclorama, World War I Museum in Kansas City, Adler Planetarium, Field Museum, locally, Anita Purvis, uh, did a little work at Spurlock, the local Children's Museum, Bloomington Zoo, so you might recognize some of those, those places. And tell us where you're located. We're in Rantoul, Illinois, yeah. Wow. Yeah. The <laughs> The Hot mecca spot. of I mean, museum <laughs> exhibit displays. I mean, wow, how do you how do you choose Rantoul? I mean, how do you how'd you find that location? Well, you know, we started the business in Muhammad on a okay. little farm, and you know, we we kept growing, and so I was looking for our own um, facility instead of renting, and basically I found a, a building in Rantoul, and the price was right, and because we have uh, four interstates that come through here, we can transport our exhibits all nice. over. We can keep our overhead low compared to our competition that's in nice. urban environments. You know, you know, an artist can afford to raise their family here in a smaller community yeah. um, and so it, it just sort of worked out for us. I mean just think about the strategic elements that you just ticked off you know logistics you know transportation cost of living you mm -hmm. know access I mean there's some thought into yeah. where you locate a business. Absolutely, yeah. Uh, and not only where you located in Rantoul, but you've also been able to leverage some property in Rantoul. Tell us where your studio is located <laughs> and what was used to be in that space. Yeah, the production facility is in an old Walmart building, so my staff now calls it Taylor Mart. <laughs> <laughs> and so we have uh, over 65,000 square foot of production space. My office building is about 12,000 square foot, so that's where we house design, project management, marketing, accounting, administration. Rantoul base, headquartered in Rantoul, and now aspirations for China. Talk yeah. to us about China. Well, um, you know, I've been, I went to Hong Kong about eight years ago with the intent of pursuing the Asia market. You know, I wasn't as aggressive enough as I needed to be to, to pursue that market because we had enough opportunities here, um, but I really want to diversify our revenue. So recently, one of the museums I met somewhere, you know, emailed and said, will you go after this job? And so they asked us to participate in this bid process. So that's what I'm doing. Wow. Yeah. And you're going back to China, you say? So that, I mean, that must be grueling to do that type of international travel. Yeah. Well, to learn a whole new culture and a whole new d way to do business, so I am learning as fast as I can. So that's the tricky part. Obviously, the flight's no fun. <laughs> 14 hours in the air. Yeah. Um, but is it important for you physically to be there face to face to yeah. engage with these folks? Absolutely. Their culture, um, you need to do that. You need to be face to face. And so the client, I had been emailing a lot. She's like, you got to get here. You have to get here. So I'm, like, I'm, on, my, I'm on a plane. So she gave me 10 days notice and I went. Uh, Betty's also a Hall of Famer. 
uh, Business Hall of Fame. Uh, talk about you know that recognition and some of the qualities you think uh, led to your recognition. Well, that's with SIU, so they recognized me. Um, that's where you know it all started, and, and it was a, a grand adventure back I'm then. I'm a Saluki too. As all well. right, I'm not a Hall of Famer, <laughs> but you know I love the Saluki connection. Yeah, I'm on their external advisory board of the, for the School of Business too, so I love going back and yeah. giving back to what they gave to me. Sure. Um, why? You know, I think just entrepreneur success is sort of a uh, Cinderella story in a way. I yeah. just grew up in an Illinois farm. I had humble roots. I paid my own way through college by horse training and working multiple jobs. And, and so maybe an example to the students that they can do this too if I can do it. Nice. Um, so. And the environment today for entrepreneurs and business startups. Just talk a little bit about the uh, overall uh, landscape for, for entrepreneurs, free enterprise in this country. Oh, I'm very concerned. Um, I see more regulation all the time, which is, you know, is concerning. Um, you know, what's going to happen with health care, I don't know, so that intimidates you. You know, I have currently less than 50 employees, and I'm scared to go beyond that because of, you know, Family Medical Leave Act and how much administration work that adds to my company. The amount of accounting I have to do to keep up on tax codes is just, my, my accounting is this big. So it seems that I could offer more value if I was doing less of that. Mm -hmm. You know, so if it was all simplified, I could be more productive and offer my clients more value. So it, it, at times it's very frustrating on the other hand I'm being a bit hypocritical because a lot of the money does come from government so I, that's part of why I'm diversifying interesting mm -hmm. what is it about you character wise your personality who you are that you think when the going gets tough this is what drives me this is what pushes me what are your characteristics that make you successful Oh, well, certainly driven. I, I don't give up easily. Um, you know, you know. I always kind of think, what's the worst thing that could happen? And I suppose I could live in a van down by the river. And well, no guts, no glory. Well, I'll go can, for you it. You can make some kind of environment. <laughs> yeah, you know? yeah. You don't yeah. have to make a swamp. At least make, I got know. the river. <laughs> exactly. Nice. And so I'm, you know, I give it a shot. I take the risk. I take the risk with safe, you know, projections and and try to do it safely. But um, I'll take the risk. So what about the responsibility too and the accountability that you have for not only yourself but mm -hmm. your firm but you said you have 50 employees too I have around 40 now but you know we're projecting to grow Talk um, about that responsibility and Yeah that's that's the toughest part about owning a business I mean I had the most sleepless nights over you know managing staff and trying to juggle all things that come with staff and of course I worry about them and when you know things take a dip and how you know I got 40 families to feed in a way yeah. so there's a lot to worry about How's Rantoul been for business development you know we don't often hear you know the success stories in Rantoul you know with mm -hmm. the base leaving and some challenges they have up there but mm -hmm. what a marvelous story of success in the Rantoul and talk about that community and some of mm -hmm. the things that you're doing to give back. Yeah, well, the, the city certainly has been supportive of having uh, us there. Um, we have currently donated what we call a, a CEP plan. It's an experience plan for the town, which will help tell their story. So there's a cohesive story when a visitor comes or a new resident comes. We talk about their past, their their present, and what they want the, the city to be like in the future. Mm -hmm. And you know, we'll bring in cohesive look and theming elements to the town if the town wants that. And so we're trying to do some social outreach and get some buy-in and sort of bring the community together around a central story. This notion of storytelling and immersing yourself in environments, uh, it's important. It's yeah. what you would think folks need to focus on if they want to do a marketing or any kind of strategy related to getting the word out. Talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I mean, I think storytelling is, is really important. I think people remember stories. You know, they remember stories more than they remember statistics and facts, even though I love statistics and facts. But, <laughs> but uh, you know, storytelling can engage people. It can help you get buy-in. You know, and if you can get input from, from many people around a story, and you can, it, it's sort of like setting goals and objectives through storylines. And so then if you can get people behind a storyline, then you're more likely to make something happen. And has that been the strategy from day one with Taylor Studios, or did you evolve that strategy to the point where, yeah, now that's where you're focused? Or did you see that intuition from day one that that's what the work that you wanted to do? Well, this was the work I wanted to do, but the storytelling and what we call interpretive planning is what it's called is is somewhat new, you know, maybe more than a decade ago. Okay. Uh, in the beginning, we, we did a lot of fabrication and then we added design, but, um, you know, we certainly have developed the interpretive planning aspect of the business. 
Well, you have a fascinating story mm -hmm. to tell yourself with a Taylor Studio. Congratulations on Thank your you. success. It's delighted to have you as a guest here on the Dollars and Cents. Thanks. We'll be back right after this. Welcome back to Dollars and Cents. Delighted to have Mike Brown, CEO of Covenant Medical Center on the program. Mike, welcome to Dollars and Cents. Paul, thanks for having me. <laughs> it's been a while since we had a hospital CEO on the program, and uh, so we thought we'd ask Mike and uh, kind of get an update uh, on the business of medicine. But first, Mike, why don't you just share a little bit uh, about yourself and, and kind of what got you into, into healthcare as a profession? Well, that's a really long story, Paul. <laughs> um, you know, I spent um, most of my life in public service and, and um, was a professional firefighter and paramedic and decided I wanted to do more and, and went and got a nursing license and a credential to do that and, and uh, moved into full-time emergency and ICU medicine. And um, as things evolved, I found myself wanting to do more and more in the, in the hospital operations side. And so 30-plus um, years of, of now working in hospitals, um, I have the opportunity to work with one of the, the state's largest health systems uh, here in Illinois. That's pretty awesome. Uh, most folks, you know, probably don't understand, and I'm sure they don't, because folks that work in the industry often don't understand, you know, the business of medicine. You know, people are there to get healed, people are there to receive care, but there's also a business side, an economic side, and, you know, maybe share with us a little insight there on, on how you decide or differentiate between, you know, managing, caring for people versus the business side of medicine. Yeah, you know, I think probably most people are aware uh, of the business of medicine if they've had to use health services or they've had to pay insurance premiums or they've watched the changes in the industry as it relates to how we get care. Um, you know, hospitals are, are obviously going to take care of people who present to them. Uh, the faith-inspired hospitals such as, as Covenant Medical Center are certainly going to treat everybody who comes to our door. Um, but there's a cost for doing that work. and. Uh, we face some very unique challenges as we walk forward with the Affordable Care Act and what that means to people and uh, people's a sense of being able to be treated by the most advanced diagnostic and therapeutics uh, available anywhere in the world. Um, yet, none of that, that comes cheaply and the cost of, of providing that care and providing medicine just continues to escalate. Where the President's health plan obviously seeks to address that and there are going to be a lot of choices that have to be made about your personal health, company's health, the nation's health, uh, and where we go with that. If you are talking to somebody um, not affiliated with healthcare, doesn't have any real understanding about the transformational changes, frankly, that are occurring in the industry, you know, what would you say to a Mike, or what are the areas that you think people ought to pay attention to or ought to look to these areas for the changes that might impact them down the road as some of these legislative priorities start taking effect? Well, the first thing I'd tell them uh, is a lot like the amusement park right at the roller coaster, right? Keep your hands and feet inside the ride at all times. This is going to get bumpy. Um, because outside of that, the changes that are coming our way uh, are, are really tidal wave type changes. Um, it's out there. We won't see the same levels of care for everyone that we've previously seen. People will have to make choices probably between private and public sector kinds of work. Um, where does the word rationing fit into what healthcare looks like? What are we willing to be paid? How far can institutions go with continuing to uh, push down on the amount of money that's available to do that? And uh, you don't have to look too hard um, anywhere to see that the cost of medicine in the United States uh, exceeds that of any place else in the world. Um, frankly, if you were to look at the statistics of the Organization of Economic Developed Countries, you'd find that we spend three times the mean amount in the United States of the other 34 countries that are a part of that consortium. And that's a challenge for us. Talk about the cost of care towards the end of your life. Yeah, you know, you're absolutely right. And, and you can also find in those statistical formats that uh, about 79% of all the money we spend on our personal health care is in the last two years of life. 50% in the last two weeks. Now let's just take a second there and, and think about that. That's a remarkable statistic. 79% of all of the dollars that I'll spend in my health care will occur in the last two weeks of my life. Yeah, 50% in the last two weeks, 79% in the last two years. Why, why is that? Well, I mean, if you really look at that and you say, you know, um, how do people our age access care? And it really should be about preventive medicine and, and making sure that you, you get your annual physical and the work that comes. And 
um, unfortunately, most of us um, as, as men our age um, tend not to want to go ask the questions because we're afraid of the answers. No kidding. Um, and the ladies are not like that. Um, it's just a given fact. But as we walk forward in that and we find that the older we get, the more things there are to go wrong and the things that we need to get fixed. And as we get older, that continues to be the case. I think compounding that issue um, has to do with the medical negligence client. Uh, climate for physicians and, and practitioners and uh, having to practice what would be known as defensive medicine and, and making sure we've done everything to avoid uh, being involved in litigation. We're really fortunate in this in this community in terms of uh, access to health care to you know very strong you know hospitals but it must present some challenges to you as the leader of one of those health care institutions to try to determine you know where do we fit or you fit at Covenant with Carl Christie and just talk about the local marketplace for health care. Yeah you know we are very fortunate um, here in the Champaign-Urbana area to have two very strong and vibrant hospitals and um, add to that the Christie Clinic with the number of physicians that are there and, and what we're able to to do. Um, with that comes challenge as well as we walk forward in looking at accountable care and how we're able to collaborate and cooperate as opposed to compete. Um, that's going to be um, a big change for folks as they see the institutions looking to manage the health of a community, not the health of an individual. You, know, you look at this institution here, Parkland College, uh, we're very grateful that uh, they give us the opportunity to do some local original programming. Um, hospitals have to have strong relationships with community colleges, uh, nursing programs, you got the university in our backyard. Just talk about you know the importance of uh, connecting with, with other institutions in the community as well. Oh yeah, I think you're absolutely right. That's that's huge. And uh, you know, Dr. Tom Ramage here at Parkland um, is clearly a community advocate and looks for every way he can uh, to connect this college to uh, Champaign County, the Champaign Urbana communities, and uh, what that means. And the U of I, no different uh, with the amount of research. And, and we have certainly talked about what goes on at the Beckman Institute and um, other areas within the university. And um, this is a community who's very fortunate to have that kind of educational leverage and then to pair it with not just healthcare but how many other industries within our community that that they reach out and touch and um, and not just provide workforce um, well-trained educated workforce but to really be able to leverage uh, the knowledge base of places uh, and to get into some translational research kinds of process it's it's awesome uh, from the healthcare side I can only imagine that from um, you know, the manufacturing side that they see some of the other um, advances and nuances in, in what's coming. So You see so much opportunity when you talk about, you know, community resources and partners in the community. And then on the other side, you balance that with the legislative challenges and the business of medicine. You know, how, how do you put both of those together and, and give us a prediction, you know, for health care in the community and nationally going forward? Yeah. You know, it, and it really is about being able to tie all the resources together that, that are available to us and use them, mm -hmm. optimize them um, to the potential that we would all like to see them. There are a variety of resources that are underutilized. There are a variety of other resources that are currently overtaxed. And how we figure out that balance and being able to change uh, people's perceptions and expectations about what might be happening um, in particular healthcare communities. And, you know, it's it, again, it's going to affect everyone. Um, if you happen to be one of the baby boomers who's thinking that you're going to get to retire or perhaps you just have and, and you've worked all your life to be able to have the, the benefits of Medicare and not pay for insurance, well, um, l let me simply let you know that there aren't enough people in the following two generations to pay for that. Mm -hmm. um, and so what will happen to that piece as we know it? If you happen to be one of the people in those two generations, thank you. Uh, <laughs> uh, you're going to help to fund some of the rest of this right. for us. But health care as you know it as you age is clearly going to be different than what your parents and your grandparents saw. Um, we are in for, again, a tidal wave of change as it comes to the face of healthcare um, and what people are going to be able to expect from it um, over time. It's comforting to know, and I think the folks will pick up on it, that we have thoughtful, intelligent, bright folks like yourself leading uh, these institutions of healthcare in the community to help us figure this out. Mike, thanks for joining us. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Mike Brown, CEO of Covenant Medical Center. Uh, we'll wrap this, uh, this show up when we return. Welcome back to Dollars and Cents. I want to thank uh, Betty Brennan from Taylor Studios, Susan Jebson from uh, Reynolds Towing, and, of course, Mike Brown uh, from Covenant Medical Center joining us on this edition of Dollars and Cents. Uh, just another 
a collection of uh, terrific entrepreneurial free enterprise thinkers all making things happen in the local community. Thanks again to Chris and Mike here at PCTV for another uh, edition of Dollars and Cents. And for now, we're glad that you joined us and look forward to uh, the next program here on Dollars and Cents.